Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm Lucas Perry. Today's episode is with David Chalmers and explores his brand new book, Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. For those not familiar with David, he is a philosopher and cognitive scientist who specializes in the philosophy of mind and language. He is a professor of philosophy and neuroscience at New York University and is the co-director of NYU's Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness. Professor Chalmers is widely known for his formulation of the hard problem of consciousness, which asks why a physical state, like the state of your brain, is conscious rather than non-conscious. Before we jump into the interview, we have some important but bittersweet changes to this podcast to announce. After a lot of consideration, I will be moving on from my role as host of the FLI podcast, and this means two things. The first is that FLI is hiring for a new host for the podcast. As host, you would be responsible for the guest selection, interviews, production, and publication of the FLI podcast. If you're interested in applying for this position, keep your eye on the careers tab on the futureoflife.org website for more information. The second is that even though I will no longer be the host of the FLI podcast, I'll still be in the podcasting space. I'm starting a brand new podcast focused on exploring questions around wisdom, philosophy, science, and technology, where you'll see some of the same themes we explore here, like existential risk and AI alignment. I'll have more details about my new podcast soon. If you'd like to stay up to date, you can follow me on Twitter at LucasFMPerry, link in the description. This isn't my final time on the FLI podcast. I've got three more episodes, including a special farewell episode, so there's still more to come. I'm really grateful to have gotten the chance to interview David as one of my final episodes on the FLI podcast. It was a great pleasure connecting with him, and I hope you find this episode enjoyable and valuable as well. And so with that, I'm very happy to introduce David Chalmers on his newest book, Reality Plus. Welcome to the podcast, David. It's a really big pleasure to have you here. I've been been looking forward to this. We both love philosophy, so I, I think this will be a lot of fun. Um, and we're here today to discuss your, your newest book, uh, Reality Plus. How would you see this as fitting in with the longer term project of your career in philosophy? Oh, boy. Um, this book is all about reality. Um, I think of philosophy as being about, to a very large extent, about the mind, about the world, and about relationships between the mind and the world. In a lot of my earlier work, I've focused on the mind. I was drawn into philosophy by the problem of, of consciousness, understanding how a physical system could be conscious, trying to understand consciousness in scientific philosophical terms. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of other issues in, uh, in philosophy too. And as my career has gone on, I guess I've grown more and more interested in the world side of the equation, the nature of reality, the nature of the world, such that the mind can know it. Um, so I guess you know, I wrote a fairly technical book back in 2010, 2012, called Constructing the World, that was all about, you know, what is, uh, the, so what is the simplest vocabulary you can use to, uh, to describe reality. But um, one thing that uh, was really distinctive to this book was thinking about it in terms of technology. Um, you know, in philosophy, it's often important to, it often, is interesting and cool to uh, take an old philosophical issue and give it a technological twist. I mean, maybe this is most clear in the case of thinking about the mind and then thinking about the mind through the lens of AI. Are artificial minds possible? That's a big question for anybody. If they are, maybe that tells us something interesting about the human mind. If artificial minds are possible, then um, 
maybe the human mind is in relevant ways analogous, for example, to an artificial intelligence. Um, then well, the same kind of question comes up for thinking about reality and the world or artificial worlds possible. Normally we think about, okay, ordinary physical reality and the mind's relation to that. But um, with technology, there's uh, now a lot of impetus to think about artificial realities, realities that we construct. And the crucial case there is virtual realities, computational based realities, virtual worlds, of the kind, even of the kind we might construct, say, with, uh, with video games or full scale virtual realities, full scale universe simulations. And then a bunch of analogous questions come up. Um, are artificial realities genuine realities? And just in the artificial mind case, I want to say artificial minds are genuine minds. Well, likewise, in the artificial world case, I want to say, yeah, virtual realities are genuine realities. And that's, in fact, the central slogan of this new book, Reality Plus, which is very much trying to look at some of these philosophical issues about reality through the lens of technology and virtual realities, as well as trying to get some philosophical insight into this kind of virtual reality technology in its own right by thinking about it philosophically. This is the process I call techno-philosophy, using technology to shed light on philosophy and using philosophy to shed light on technology. So you mentioned, um, of course, you're widely known as a philosopher of consciousness, and it's been a lot of what you focused on throughout your career. You also describe this transition from being interested in consciousness to being interested in the world increasingly over your career. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, it's like I've always been, you know, you can't be interested in one of these things without being interested in the other thing. So I've always been very interested in uh, in reality. And even in my first book on consciousness, there was speculation about the nature of reality. Maybe I talked about the it from bit hypothesis there. Maybe reality is made of information. I talked about quantum mechanics and potential connections to consciousness. So, yeah, you can't think about, say, the mind-body problem without thinking about bodies as well as minds. You, you have to think about physical reality. But, uh, I mean, there's one particular distinctive question about the nature of reality, namely, how much can we know about it? And uh, can we know anything about the external world? That's a very traditional problem in philosophy. It goes back to Descartes saying, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? Or how do you know you're not being fooled by an evil demon who's producing sensations as of an external world when none of this is real? And for a long time, I thought I just didn't have that much to say about this very big question in philosophy. I mean, I think of like the problem of consciousness, the mind, the mind body problem. That's a really big question in the, uh, the history of philosophy. But to be honest, I've got to say it's probably not number, not number one. Number one, in the, at least in the Western philosophical tradition, is how do we know anything about the external world? And for a long time, I thought I didn't have anything to say about that. And at a certain point, um, partly through thinking about you know, virtual realities and the simulation hypothesis, I thought, yeah, maybe there is something new to say here via this idea that you know, virtual realities are genuine realities. Maybe these hypotheses that Descartes put forward saying, if this is the case, then none of this is real. Maybe Descartes was actually thinking about these hypotheses wrongly. And I actually got drawn into this around the same time, just totally fortuitously. I got invited to write an article for The Matrix website. A bunch of philosophers were, uh, their production company, Red Pill, uh, there was a guy called, a philosopher called Chris Graal who worked for them. And I guess the Wachowskis were super interested in philosophy. They wanted to see what philosophers thought of philosophical issues coming from the, uh, from the movie. So I ended up writing an article called The Matrix as Metaphysics, putting forward this rough point of view, which is roughly in the context of the movie, that even in the movie they say, well, if we're in the matrix, none of what we're experiencing is real. All this is an illusion or a fiction. I tried to argue, even if you're in the matrix, these things around you are still perfectly real. There are still trees, there are still cats, there are still chairs, there are still planets. It's just that they're ultimately digital, but they're still perfectly real. And I tried to use that way of thinking about the matrix to provide a response to Descartes, who's you know, the version of Descartes who says, we can never know anything about the external world because we can't rule out that none of this is real. 
all those scenarios Descartes had in mind, I think in some sense there are actually scenarios where things are real. And that makes uh, this vision of reality, is, maybe it makes reality a bit more like virtual reality, but that vision of reality actually puts knowledge of the external world more within our grip. So, and I guess, and from there, there's a clean path from writing that article 20 years ago to writing this book now, which takes this idea of virtual reality as genuine reality and tries to just draw it out in all kinds of directions, to argue for it, to connect to, you know, present day technology, uh, to connect it to a bunch of issues in philosophy and science. Because if I'm going to start thinking this way about reality, at least I've found, you know, it changes everything. It changes all kinds of things about uh, your vision of the world. So I think that gives a really good taste of uh, what is to come in this interview and also what's in your book. Before we dive more into those specifics, uh, I'm also just curious what your favorite part of the book is. Like, um, if there's some section, or maybe there isn't, uh, that you're most excited to talk about, what, what, what would that be? Oh, I don't know. Um, I was going to say my favorite parts of the book are the illustrations. <laughs> Amazing illustrations by uh, Tim Peacock, who's a, a great illustrator who I found out about and asked if he'd be able to do uh, illustrations for the book. And he took so many of these of these scenarios, philosophical thought experiments, science fiction scenarios, and came up with wonderful illustrations to go along with it. So we've got Plato's cave, but updated for the 21st century with uh, people in virtual reality inside Plato's cave with Mark Zuckerberg running the cave. Or uh, we have uh, an ancient Indian thought experiment about uh, Narada and Vishnu updated in the light of, of Rick and Morty. We've got a teenage girl hacker creating a simulated universe in the, uh, in the next universe up. So these illustrations are wonderful, but I guess that doesn't quite answer your question of which parts do I especially want to talk about. I guess I think, I think of the book as having roughly two halves. There's half of it is kind of broadly about the simulation hypothesis, the idea that the universe is a simulation and trying to use that idea to shed light on all kinds of philosophical problems. And the other half, is um, more about real virtual reality, you know, the coming actual virtual reality technology that we have and that will develop in the next, say, 50 to 100 years, and trying to, uh, to make sense of that and the issues it brings up. So in the first part of the book, I talk about very abstract issues about uh, knowledge and reality and the simulation hypothesis. But in the second, the second part of the book, it gets a bit more down to earth and even comes to issues about ethics, about value, about political philosophy, how should we set up a virtual world? And I guess over time, I mean, that was, that was more of a departure for me to be thinking about some of those, uh, those more practical and political issues. But over time, I've come to find they're fascinating to think about. So I guess I'm actually equally fascinated by, uh, by both sets um, of issues, but... Uh, but I guess lately I've been thinking especially about um, some of these second class of issues because a lot of people, given you know the coming, all the corporations now are playing up the metaverse and coming virtual reality technology. That's been a, that's been really interesting to think about. So um, given these two halves in general, uh, and also the way that the book is structured, uh, what would you say are your central claims in this book? What is the the thesis of the book? Yeah, the thesis of the book. Uh, that I lay out in the introduction is virtual reality is genuine reality. It's not a second class reality. It's not fake or fictional. Uh, virtual reality is real. And that kind of breaks down into a number of sub theses. One of them is about like, you know, the existence of objects and it's a thesis in metaphysics. Uh, it says, well, in a virtual, the objects in virtual reality are real objects a virtual tree or uh is a real object it may be a digital object but it's real all the same it has causal powers can affect us it's out there independently of us it needn't be an illusion so yeah virtual objects are real objects what happens in virtual reality really happens that's one kind of uh, one kind of thesis another thesis is about value or meaning that you can lead a valuable life you can lead a meaningful life inside a virtual world. Some people have thought that virtual worlds can only ever be escapist or fictions or 
not quite the real thing. I argue that you can lead a perfectly meaningful life. And the third kind of thesis is tied closer to the, uh, the simulation hypothesis idea. And there I argue, I don't argue that we are in fact in a computer simulation, but I do argue that we can never know that we're not in a simulation. There's no way to exclude the possibility that we're in a simulation. So that's a hypothesis to take very seriously. And then I use that hypothesis to flesh out a, a number of different, just say we are in a simulation, then yeah, what would this mean for say, our knowledge of the world? What would this mean for, for the reality of God? What would this mean for the underlying nature of the metaphysics underneath physics and so on? And I try and use that to just uh, put forward a number of subtheses in each of these domains. So the, the, these claims also seem to line up with uh, really core questions in philosophy, um, particularly having to do with knowledge, reality, and value. So could, could you explain a little bit, like, what are some of the core areas of philosophy and how they line up with um, your exploration of, of this issue through this book? Yeah, I mean, traditionally, philosophy is at least sometimes divided up into three areas, metaphysics, epistemology, and the theory of value. Metaphysics is basically questions about reality. Epistemology is basically questions about knowledge. And value theory is questions about, yeah, about value, about good versus bad, and better versus worse. And in the book, I kind of divide up these questions about virtual worlds into three big questions in each of these areas, which I call the knowledge question, the reality question, and the value question. The knowledge question is, uh, can we know whether we're in a virtual world. Yeah, and in particular, can we, can we ever be sure that we're not in a virtual world? And there I argue for an answer of no. We can never know for sure that we're not in a virtual world. We can never exclude that possibility. But then there's the reality question, which is roughly, if we are in a virtual world, is the world around us real? Are these objects real? Are virtual realities genuine realities or are they somehow illusions or fictions? And there I argue for the answer, yes, virtual worlds are real. Entities and events in virtual world are perfectly real entities and events. And even if we're in a simulation, the objects around us are still real. So that's a thesis in metaphysics. Then there's the question in value theory, which is uh, roughly, can you lead a good life in a virtual world? And there, as I suggested before, I want to argue, yes, you can lead a good and meaningful life in a virtual world. So yeah, the three big questions behind the book each correspond then to a big uh, question, a big area of philosophy. And I think they actually, I would like to think they actually illuminate not just questions about virtual worlds, but big questions in those areas more generally. The big question of knowledge is, can we know anything about the external world? The big question of reality is, you know, what is the nature of reality? The big question about value is, what is it to lead a good life? Those are big traditional philosophical questions. I think thinking about each of those three questions through the, len through the, the lens of virtual reality and trying to answer the more specific questions about what is the status of knowledge, reality, and value in a virtual world, that can actually shed light on those big questions of philosophy more broadly. So what I try to do is in the book is often start with the case of the virtual world, give a philosophical analysis of that, and then try to draw out morals about the big traditional philosophical question more broadly. Sure, and this this seems like it's something uh, you bring up as uh, techno philosophy in the book, where philosophy is used to inform the use of technology, and then technology is used to inform philosophy. So it's there's kind of like this mutual beneficial uh, exchange through techno philosophy. Yeah, philosophy is this two-way interaction between philosophy and technology. So what I've just been talking about now, using virtual reality technology and virtual worlds to shed light on big traditional philosophical questions, that's the, uh, that's the, er the direction in which technology sheds light on philosophy, or at least thinking philosophically about technology can shed light on big traditional questions in philosophy that weren't cast in terms of technology. You know, can we know we're not in a simulation that sheds light on what we can know about the world? Um, can we lead a, 
a good life in a virtual world that shed some light on what it is to lead a good life and so on. So yeah, this is the half of techno philosophy where thinking about technology sheds light on philosophy. The other half is thinking philosophically, using philosophy to shed light on technology and just thinking philosophically about virtual reality technology, uh, simulation technology, augmented reality technology, and so on. And that's, uh, and that's I think, something I really try to do um, in the book as well. And I think these two things, these two processes, of course, complement each other, because thinking, you think philosophically about technology, it sheds some light on the technology, but then it turns out actually to have some impact on the broader issue, broader issues of philosophy at the same time. Sure. So uh, what's coming up for me is uh, Plato's cave allegory is actually like a form of technology of techno philosophy, potentially, where, where like the, the, the candle is a kind of technology that's being used to, you know, cast shadows to inform how Plato is examining the world. That's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but I suppose back around Plato's time, I mean, people did a, did a whole lot with uh, with candles and fire. You know, these were very major yeah. uh, technologies of the time, and maybe at a certain point, people started developing puppet technology and started doing puppet style shows that were a, a form of I don't know entertainment technology for them. And then for Plato then to be thinking about the cave in this way, yeah, it is a bit of a technological setup. And Plato is using this new uh, this new technology to make claims about reality. Plato also wrote about other technologies. He wrote about writing, you know, the invention of writing. And he was quite down on it. He thought, you know, or at least his spokesman, Socrates, said, uh, you know, in the old days, people would remember all the old tales. They'd carry them around in their head and tell them person to person. And... Uh, now that you can write them down, no one has to remember them anymore. And he thought this was a somehow a, a step back in the way in which some people these days think that you know, yeah, putting all this stuff on your smartphone might be a might be a step back. But yeah, Plato was very uh, very sensitive to the technologies of the time. So let's make a beeline for your central claims in this book. Uh, and just just before we do that, I have a kind of a simple question here for you. Maybe it's not so simple. Uh, but w so, what is virtual reality? Yeah, the way I define it in the book, I make a distinction between a virtual world and virtual reality. Where roughly, you know, virtual reality technology is immersive. Um, it's the kind of thing you experience, say, with an Oculus Quest headset that you uh, that you uh, put onto your uh, onto your head, and you experience a three dimensional space all around you. Whereas a virtual world needn't be immersive. When you play a, a video game, when you're playing World of Warcraft or you're in Fortnite. Um, typically, there's just a, uh, there's just a, you're doing this on a two-dimensional screen. It's not fully immersive, but there's still a computer-generated world. So my definitions are a virtual world is an interactive computer-generated world. It has to be interactive. If it's just a movie, then that's not yet a virtual world. But if you can perform actions within the world and so on, and it's computer-generated, that's a virtual world. A virtual reality is an immersive, interactive, computer-generated world. Then with the extra condition, this has to be experienced, you know, in 3D with you at the, uh, at the center of it, typically these days experienced with a VR headset. And that's, a, that's virtual reality. So yeah, virtual reality is an immersive, interactive, computer-generated reality. So one of the central claims that you mentioned earlier was that virtual reality is is genuine genuine reality. So c could you begin explaining uh, why is it that you believe that virtual reality is genuine reality? Yeah, because a lot of this depends on what you mean by uh, by real and by genuine reality. And one thing I do in the book is try and break out different number of different meanings of real. What is it for something to be real? One is that it has some causal powers, that it can make a difference in the world. One is that it's out there independent of our minds. It's not just all in the mind. And one, maybe the most important, is that it's not an illusion. It's not just that, you know, things are roughly as they seem to be. And I try to argue that if we're in VR, the objects we see have all of these, all of these, uh, these properties. Basically, the idea is 
When you're in virtual reality, you're interacting with digital objects, objects that exist as data structures on computers, actual concrete processes up and running on a computer. And we're interacting with, uh, with concrete data structures realized in circuitry on these computers. And those digital objects have real causal powers. They make things happen. They're, when two objects interact in VR, the two corresponding data structures on a computer are genuinely interacting with each other. When an object, virtual object appears a certain way to us, that data structure is at the beginning of a causal chain that affects our conscious experience in much the same way that a physical object might be at the start of a causal chain affecting our experience. And most importantly, I want to argue that I uh, just say, you know, let's take the extreme case of a, uh, I find it useful to start with the extreme case of the simulation hypothesis, where all of this is a simulation. Um, I want to say in that case, you know, when I have an experience of say a tree in front of me, or um, here's, a, here's a desk and a chair, um, I want to say none of that is illusory. There's no, uh, there's no illusion there. You're interacting with a, uh, with a digital object, a digital table or a digital chair, but it's still perfectly real. And what, the way that I end up arguing for this in the book is to argue that the simulation hypothesis should be seen as equivalent to a kind of hypothesis which has um, become familiar in physics. It's a version of the so-called it from bit hypothesis. The it from bit hypothesis says roughly that physical reality is grounded in a level of interaction of bits or some computational process. You know, the paradigm illustration here would be Conway's Game of Life, where you have a cellular automata with cells that can be on or off and simple rules governing their interaction. And various people have speculated that the laws of physics could be grounded in some kind of algorithmic process, perhaps analogous to Conway's Game of Life. People call this digital physics. And, you know, it's not especially widely believed among physicists, but there are some people who take it seriously. And at least it's a coherent hypothesis that, yeah, there's a level of bits underneath uh, physical objects in reality. And importantly, you know, if the it from bit hypothesis is true, this is not a hypothesis where nothing is real. It's just a world where there still are chairs and tables. There still are atoms and quarks. It's just they're made of bits. There's a level underneath the quarks, the level of, uh, of bits things are perfectly real. So in the book, I try to argue that actually the simulation hypothesis is equivalent to this it from bit hypothesis. It's basically, if we're in a simulation, yeah, there are still tables and chairs, atoms and quarks. There's just a level of bits. Um, underneath that, all this is realized maybe by a computer process involving the interaction of bits. And maybe there's something underneath that in turn that leads to what I call the it from bit from it hypothesis. Maybe if we're in a simulation, there's a, you know, a number of levels like this. But uh, yeah, the key then is the argument that these two hypotheses are equivalent, which is a, a case I try to make in, uh, in chapter nine of the book. Um, you know, the argument itself is, is complex, but there's a nice illustration to, uh, to illustrate it. On one hand, we've got a, a traditional God creating the universe by creating some bits by, uh, by, yeah, let there be bits, uh, God says, and lays out the bits and gets them interacting. And then we get tables and chairs out of that. And in the other world, we have a hacker who does the same thing, except via a computer. Uh, let there be bits, you know, arranged on the, uh, on the computer. And we get, uh, we get virtual tables and chairs out of that. And I want to argue that the, uh, the, the God creation scenario and the, uh, the hacker simulation scenario are basically isomorphic. Okay, uh, my I'm being uh, overwhelmed here with uh, all of the different uh, ways that we could take this. So one way to come at this is from the metaphysics of it, where we look at kind of uh, cosm different cosmological understandings. You talk in your book about there being this. What is it called? The dust theory. Mm -hmm. um, there, there may be some kind of like dust which can implement any number of like arbitrary algorithms which then, uh, you know, potentially above that there are bits and then uh, ordinary reality as we perceive it is kind of structured and layered on top of that. Um, and looking at reality in this way can help to, you know, it gives kind of a computationalist view of metaphysics and so also the world 
which then informs how we can think about virtual reality. Uh, and in particular, the, the, the simulation hypothesis. So um, w could you introduce the, uh, the dust theory and how that's, that's related to the it from bit argument? Yeah, the dust theory is an idea that was put forward by the Australian science fiction writer Greg Egan in his book Permutation City, which came out in the mid-90s and is a wonderful science fiction novel about computer simulations. I mean, the dust theory is a very, I mean, is in certain respects even more extreme than, uh, than my view. I want to say that as long as you have the right computation and the right causal structure, between entities in reality, then you'll get genuine reality. And I argue that can be present in a physical reality, that can be present in a virtual reality. Egan goes a little bit more extreme by, than me. He says you don't even need this causal structure. All you need is unstructured dust. I mean, we call it dust. It's basically a bunch of entities that have no spatial properties, no temporal properties. It's a whole, totally unstructured set of entities, but we think of this as the dust. And he thinks the dust will actually generate every computer process that you can imagine. He thinks they can generate any objects that you imagine and any, any conscious being that you can imagine. And so on, because he thinks there's ways of interpreting the dust so that, uh, you know, it's, for example, implementing any computer program whatsoever. And in this respect, Egan has actually got some things in common with philosophers like uh, the American philosophers Hilary Putnam and John Searle, who argued that computation is somehow, uh, you can find any computation anywhere. Um, Searle argued that his wall implemented the, uh, the WordStar word processing program. Putnam suggested that maybe a rock could implement complex computations, basically because you can always map the parts of the computation of the physical object onto the parts of the computation. I actually disagree with this view. I think it's too unconstrained. I think it makes it too easy for things for things to be real. Um, roughly, the reason is I think you need constraints of cause and effect between the objects. For a bunch of entities in a rock or a wall to implement, say, a word star, they have to be arranged in a certain way, so they go through certain state transitions. And so they would go through different state transitions in different circumstances to actually implement that algorithm. And that requires genuine causal structure. And yeah, way back in the 90s, I wrote a couple of articles arguing that the structure you'll find in a, you know, in a wall or a rock is not enough to implement most computer programs. And I'd say exactly the same for Egan's dust theory, that the dust does not have enough structure to support a genuine reality because it doesn't have these patterns of cause and effect, uh, obeying counterfactuals, like if this had happened, then this would have happened. And so you just don't get that rich structure out of the dust. So I want to say that you can get that structure, but to get that structure, you need a uh, you need you know dust structured by cause and effect. And importantly, I think in an average computer simulation, like the simulation hypothesis, it's not like the dust. Computer simulations really have this rich causal structure going on inside the computer. You've got circuits which are hooked up to each other in the patterns of cause and effect that are isomorphic to that in the physical reality. That's why I say virtual realities are genuine realities because they actually have this underlying computational structure. But I would disagree with Egan that the dust is a genuine reality because the dust doesn't have these patterns of cause and effect. I ended up having a bunch of email with uh, with Greg Egan about this, and he was arguing for his own particular theory of causation, which went another way. But um, but yeah, at least that's where I want to hold the line. Cause and effect matters. My questions are, so what is the work then that you see the dust theory doing in your overall book in terms of your arguments for reality as, or vir sorry, for virtual reality as genuine reality? The dust theory comes relatively late in the, uh, in the book, right? Uh, earlier on, I talk about bringing in this it from bit idea that, yeah, the whole, all of reality might be grounded in information, in bits, in computational processes. I see the dust theory as being 
but it's partially tied to a certain objection somebody might make that I've made it too easy for things to be real now. If I can find reality in a whole bunch of bits like that, maybe I'm going to be able to find this reality everywhere. And even if we're just connected to dust, there'll be trees and chairs. And now isn't reality made trivial? So, I, so partly I think that's an objection I want to address. I want to say, no, it's still not trivial to have reality. You need all this structure, this kind of cause and effect, cause and effect structure or roughly equivalently a certain mathematical structure in the laws of nature. And that's really a substantive constraint. But it's also, try, it's also a way of uh, helping to motivate um, the view that I call structuralism about, and that many others have called structuralism or structural realism about physical reality, which I think is kind of actually the key to, uh, to my thesis. Why does virtual reality get to count as genuine reality? Ah, because it has the right structure. It has the right causal structure. It has the right kind of mathematically characterizable interactions between different entities. What matters is not so much what these things are made of intrinsically, but the interactions and the relations between them. And that's a view that many philosophers of science these days find very plausible. It goes back to you know, Poincaré and uh, Russell and Carnap and others. But yeah, very popular these days. What matters, say, for a theory in physics to be true is that uh, basically you've got entities with the right kind of structure of interactions between them. And if that view is right, then it gives a nice explanation of why virtual reality it counts as genuine reality. Because when you have a computer simulation of a given physical, uh, of say, of the physical world, that has all that preserves computer simulation preserves the relevant kind of structure. So, yeah, the structure of the laws of physics could be found in a physical reality, but it could also that structure can also be found in a computer simulation of that reality. Computer simulations have the right structure. But then it's, um, yeah, so it turns out that's not totally unconstrained. Some people think, um, yeah, Egan thought, yeah, the dust is good enough. Some people think purely mathematical structure is good enough. In fact, your sometime boss, Max Tegmark, I think uh, may, may think something like this in his, uh, in his book on the mathematical universe. He argues that reality is completely mathematical. And at least sometimes it seems to look as if he's saying the content of our physical theories is just purely mathematical claims that, uh, you know, there exist certain entities with a certain mathematical structure. And I worry, I worry that as with Egan, that if you understand the content of our theories is purely mathematical, then you'll find that structure anywhere. You'll find it in the dust. You'll find it in any abstract amount of mathematics. And there's a worry that actually our physical theories could be trivialized and they could all end up being true because we can always find dust or mathematical entities with the right structure. But I think if you add the constraint of cause and effect here, then it's no longer, uh, it's no longer trivialized. So I think of, yeah, Egan and Tegmark is potentially embracing a kind of structuralism, which is, uh, which is you know, even broader than mine, lets in even more kinds of things as reality. And I don't want to be quite so unconstrained. So I want to add some of these constraints of, uh, of cause and effect. So that was, so this is yeah, rather late in the book. This is kind of articulating this, the nature of the kind of structuralism that I see as underlying this view of reality. So, so, so Egan and Max might be letting in uh, entities into the category of what is real, which might not have causal force. And so, you know, you're adopting this criteria of cause and effect being important in structuralism for what counts as genuine. Yeah, I worry that if we don't at least have, um, I think cause and effect is very important to our ordinary conception of reality, that, for example, things have causal powers. If we don't have some kind of causal constraint on reality, then it becomes almost trivial to interpret, you know, reality as being anywhere. So I guess I think of, you know, what we mean by real is partly a verbal question, but I think of causal powers as very, uh, as very central to our ordinary notion of reality. And I think that manages actually to give us a, a highly constrained notion of reality where, you know, realities are at least partly individuated by their causal structures, but where, it's not how it's not now so broad that you know 
arbitrary conglomerates of dust get to count as uh, as being on a par with our physical world or arbitrary sets of mathematical entities likewise. Let's talk more about the criteria for what makes things count as real or genuine or whether or not they exist. Uh, you spent a lot of time on this in your in your book, um, sort of setting up and then arguing for different positions on whether or not certain criteria are necessary and or sufficient for um, satisfying some understanding of uh, like what is real or what is it that it means that something exists or that it's genuine. Um, and this is, you know, really important uh, for your central thesis of virtual reality being genuine reality. Um, cause it's important to know like what it is that exists and how, how virtual reality fits into what is real overall. So, um, c could you explore some of the criteria for, um, what it means for something to be part of reality or what is reality? Yeah. I end up discussing five different notions of reality of what it is for something to be real. I mean, this kind of goes back to the matrix where, uh, Neo says, this isn't real. And Morpheus says, what is real? How do you define real? And that's the question. How do you define real? Um, and I talk about five main, you know, there's any number of different things people have meant by real, but I talk about five main strands in our conception of reality. One very broad one is something is real just if it exists. Anything that exists is real. So if that tree exists, it's real, it's real. If the number two exists, it's real. I think that's often what we mean. It's also a little bit unhelpful as a criterion because it just pushes back the question to uh, what is it for something to exist, but it's a start. Then uh, the second one is the one we've just been talking about, the criterion of causal powers. This actually goes back to uh, one of Plato's dialogue where dialogues where the Eleatic stranger comes in and says, for something to be real, it's got to be able to make a difference. It's got to be able to do something. Um, that's the causal power criterion. So if you, um, to be real, you've got to have effects. Some people dispute that that's necessary. Maybe numbers could be real, even if they don't have effects. Maybe consciousness could be real, even if it doesn't have effects. But it certainly seems to be a plausible, sufficient condition. So that's causal powers. Another one is mind independence, existing independently of the mind. There's this nice slogan from, um, from Philip K. Dick, where he said, uh, reality, something is real if when you stop believing in it, it doesn't go away. Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, it doesn't go away. That's basically to say, you know, its existence doesn't depend on our beliefs. Some things, such that their existence depends on our beliefs. I don't know, the Easter Bunny or um, or something. But uh, more generally, I'd say that some things have existence that depends on our minds, maybe a mirage um, of some water up ahead. That basically depends on it, there being a certain conscious experience in my mind. But there are some things out there independent of my mind that aren't all in my mind, that don't just depend on my mind. And so it's, this leads to the third criterion, something is real, when it doesn't wholly depend on our minds. It's out there independently of us. Now, this is a controversial criterion. Um, people think that some things like money may be real, even though it largely depends on our attitudes towards it, as, towards money. Our treating something as money is part of what makes it money. And actually, uh, in the Harry Potter books, uh, I think it's Dumbledore has a, uh, has a slogan that goes the opposite way of... Um, of Philip K. Dix, at one point towards the end of the novels, Dumbledore says to Harry, uh, Harry says, ah, oh, but none of this is real. And this is all just happening inside my head. And Dumbledore says something like, just because all this is happening inside your head, Harry, why do you think that makes it any less real? So uh, I don't know, there is a kind of mental reality you get from the mind. But anyway, I think mind independence is one important thing that we have in, often have in mind when we talk about reality. Um, a fourth one is that we sometimes talk about genuineness or authenticity. And one way to get at this is we often talk about not just whether an object is real, but whether it's a real something 
like uh, maybe you have a robot kitten. Okay, it's a real object. Uh, yes, it's a real object. It's a genuine object with causal powers out there independently of us. But is it a real kitten? Is it a real kitten? Most people would say that no, a robot kitten, maybe it's a real object, but it's not a real kitten. So it's not a genuine, authentic kitten. And more generally, for any X, we can ask, is this a real X? And that's this uh, criterion of genuineness. But then maybe the deepest and most important criterion for me is the one of not basically something is real if it's not an illusion. That is, if it's roughly the way it seems to be. You know, it seems to me that I'm in this environment, there are objects all around me in space with certain colors. There's a tree out there and, uh, and there's a pond. Um, and roughly, I'd say that, you know, things are all that's real if things are, if there are things out there roughly as they seem to be. But if all this is an illusion, then those things are not real. Um, so then we say things are real if they're not an illusion, if they're roughly as they seem to be. So one thing I, I then do is to try to argue that for the simulation hypothesis, at least, if we're in a simulation, then the objects we perceive are real in all five of those senses. They have causal powers, they can do things, they're out there independently of our minds, they exist, they're genuine, that's a real tree, um, at least by what we mean by tree, and they're not illusions. So five out of five on what I call the reality checklist. Ordinary virtual reality, I wanna say it gets four out of five. The virtual objects we interact with are, they're still digital objects with causal powers out there independently of us. Um, they exist. Um, they needn't be illusions. I argue that at length that your experiences in VR needn't be illusions. You can correctly perceive a virtual world as virtual. But arguably, they're not at least uh, they're not at least genuine. Um, maybe, for example, the virtual kitten that you interact with in VR. Okay, it's a virtual kitten, but it's not a genuine kitten any more than the robot kitten is. So maybe virtual tables are not, at least in our ordinary language, genuine tables. Virtual kittens are not genuine kittens. Um, but they're still real objects. But maybe there's some sense in which they fail one of the five criteria for uh, for reality. So I say ordinary virtual realities, at least as we deal with them now, may get to four out of five or 80% on the reality checklist. It's possible that our language might evolve over time to to eventually count, you know, virtual chairs as genuine chairs and virtual kittens as genuine kittens. And then we might be more VR inclusive in our talk. And then maybe we'd come to regard virtual reality as five out of five on the checklist. But anyway, that's the rough, that's the rough way I, I end up breaking, breaking down these notions into, into at least five. And of course, one way to come back is to say, ah, oh, you've missed the crucial notion of reality. Actually, to be real requires this. Um, and VR is not real in that sense. Um, I just read a review of the book where someone said, Ah, uh, look, obviously VR isn't real because it's not part of the base level of reality, the fundamental outer shell of reality. That's what's real. So I guess this person was advocating, uh, yeah, to be real, you've got to be part of the base fundamental outer shell of reality. I mean, I guess I don't see why that has to be true. I mean, isn't it though? Well, it's, it's like implemented on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. So that's one way to, to come back to too. this is to say, the digital objects ultimately do exist in the outer, uh, in the outer shell. They're just a very small. They're undivided from the outer shell. They yeah. just look like they're just like can be conceptualized as secondary. Yeah, no, it is very much continuous with. It. I want to say at the very least they're on a par with like micro universes. I mean, you know, we have people talk now about say baby universes, growing up in black holes um, inside a larger universe and people take that seriously and then we'd still say okay well this universe is part of this universe and that part of a universe can be just as real as the universe as a whole so i don't think yeah so i guess i don't think you know being the whole universe is required to be real we've got to acknowledge reality to parts of the world
so we have kind of like a, a common sense ontology, a common sense view of the world. Um, and to me, it seems like that's more Newtonian feeling. Um, you know, science evolves and then we get quantum mechanics. And so something you describe, you explore in your book is this difference between, um, I forget what you call it, um, like the conventional view of the world and then, oh, sorry, the manifest and the scientific image is what you call it. Um and part of this manifest image is that uh, I, it, it seems like humans kind of have like uh, like our common sense ontology is kind of platonic. How would you describe the the common sense view of 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 what is real? Yeah, I talk about the Garden of Eden, which is our naive pre-theoretical sense of the world before we've started doing a doing science and developing a more sophisticated view. I do think we have, got, we have got this tendency to think about reality as like, yeah, billiard balls out there and solid objects, colored objects out there in a certain space, an absolute three-dimensional space with one dimension of time. That's our, I think that's the model of reality we had in the Garden of Eden. So yeah, one of the conceits in the book is, well, in the Garden of Eden, things actually were that way. There were three absolute dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Objects were rock solid. They were colored. The way I mark this in the book is by capital letters. Say in the Garden of Eden, there was capital S space and capital T time where objects were capital S solid and capital C colored. They were capital R red and capital G green, and maybe there was capital G good and bad and uh, capital F free will and, and so on. But then we developed the scientific view of the world. You know, we eat from the, the tree of knowledge. It gives us knowledge of, uh, of science. And then, okay, well, the world is not quite, is not quite like that naive conception implied. You know, there's no, uh, there's, four-dimensional space-time without an absolute space or time. Objects don't seem to have these primitive colors out there on their surfaces. They just have things like reflectance properties that reflect light into a certain way that affects our experience in a certain way. Uh, nothing is capital S solid. They, you know, Objects are mostly empty space, but they still manage to resist penetration in the right way. So... Um, I think of this as the fall from Eden and for many things. We've gone from capital S space to lowercase s space. We've gone from capital S solidity to lowercase s solidity. And um, one thing that I think goes on here is that we've moved from kind of a conception of these things as primitive. Yeah, primitive space and primitive colors is just like redness out there on the surface of things. What I call, yeah, primitivism rather to a kind of functionalism where we understand things in terms of their effects. Yeah, to be red now is not to have some absolute intrinsic quality of redness, but to be such as to affect us to produce certain experiences, you know, to look red. Um, to be solid is not to be absolutely intrinsically solid, but to interact with other objects in such a way that they're, um, that they're solid. Um, so I think in general, this goes along with moving from a conception of reality as all these absolute intrinsic properties out there to a much more structuralist conception of reality, where what matters for things being real is the right patterns of causal interaction with each other, um, of entities with each other. I mean, I'm not saying they're all, all, all there is to reality is structure. My own view is that consciousness in particular is not just reducible to this kind of abstract structure. Consciousness does, in fact, have some intrinsic qualities and so on. So I do think uh, that's important too. But I do think in general, the move from the naive conception to the scientific conception of reality has often involved going from these kind of a conception of these primitive intrinsic qualities to a more structural conception of reality. Right. So I, I imagine that many of the people who will resist the you know, this thesis in your book that virtual reality is genuine reality may be coming at it from, you know, the, some of these more common sense intuitions about what it means for something to be real, like red is a property that's intrinsic on the surface of a thing. Um, how do you see your your book 
So are there like common sense intuitions or misconceptions that you see your book is addressing? I mean, I guess I do think, yeah, many people do find it as common sense that virtual reality is not full scale reality, first class reality. It doesn't live up to our ordinary conception of reality. And sometimes I think they may have in mind this Edenic conception of reality, the way it was in the Garden of Eden. To which my reply is, yeah, okay, I agree. Virtual reality does not have everything that we had in the Garden of Eden conception of reality. But neither does ordinary physical reality, even in the, uh, even in the kind of physical reality developed in light of science. It's not the Garden of Eden picture of reality anymore. Uh, we've lost absolute space and absolute time. Uh, we've lost absolute colors and absolute solidity. What we have is now this complex mathematical structure of entities interacting at a deep level. I mean, yeah, the, the further you look, the more evanescent it gets. Quantum mechanics is just this, this wave function where objects don't need to have determinate positions. And who knows what's going on there in string theory and other quantum gravity theories. Um, it looks like space may not be uh, may not be fundamental at all. People have entertained the idea that time is not fundamental at all. So I'd say yeah, physical reality in a way it's um, I'm saying you know virtual reality is genuine reality. But re one way to paraphrase that is virtual reality is just as real as physical reality. If you want to hear that by saying well physical reality has turned out to be more like virtual reality then, you know, I wouldn't necessarily argue with that. Uh, physical reality is not the Garden of Eden billiard ball conception of reality anymore. It's this much more evanescent thing, which is partly characterizable by it's just playing all these, having the right kind of, a certain kind of structure. And I think all that we can find in virtual reality. So yeah, so one thing I would do to this person questioning is to say, well, what do you think even about physical reality in light of, in light of, you yeah, the last, Hundred years or so of science. Yeah, that that reviewers that reviewers comments that you mentioned come off to me as kind of being infor informed by that e the Eden view. Yeah, I think it's right. It's quite common that yeah, that's really what it is. It's our naive conception of uh, of reality and what reality is like. But yeah, maybe then it's already turned out that the world is not real in that sense. One thing I'd like to, to, to pivot here into is uh, exploring value more. And so how do you see the question of value fitting into uh, your book, right? So there's this other central thesis here that um, you can live a good life in virtual reality, which seems to go against people's common intuitions that you can't, right? There's this survey about whether or not people would go into experience machines and most people wouldn't. Yeah, you know, Nozick had this famous case of the experience machine where your body is in a tank and you get all these amazing experiences of being highly successful. When I mean, most people say they wouldn't enter the experience machine. I think of professional philosophers on a survey we did, maybe 15% said they would enter and 70 odd percent said they wouldn't and a few agnostics. The experience machine though, and many people have treated that as a, as a model for VR in general. But I think the experience machine, as Nozick described it, is actually different from VR in some respects. One is that, very important respect, is that the experience machine seems to be scripted, seems to be pre-programmed. You go in there and your life will live out a script where, yeah, you get to become world champion, but it wasn't really anything you did. It's just, uh, you know, that was just the script playing itself out. So many people think that's kind of fake. That's not something I actually did. It was just something that happened to me. VR, by contrast, you go into VR, uh, even an ordinary video game, you've still got some degree of free will. You're, uh, you're to some extent controlling what happens. You go into Second Life or Fortnite or whatever, and yeah, you can basically, you've got all kinds of, it's not scripted, it's open, it's not pre-programmed, it's open-ended. And uh, I think the virtual worlds of the future will be increasingly open-ended. So I don't think worries about the experience machine tend to undermine uh, virtual worlds. And more generally, I think I want to argue that, yeah, virtual worlds can basically be on a par with physical worlds, especially once we've recognized that they needn't be illusions, they needn't be pre-programmed and so on. Then what are they missing? I think they've got 
you know, you've got what's important to a good life, maybe consciousness, the right kind of subjective experiences, also relationships, very, very important. But, uh, you know, I think in a VR in a multi, yeah, certainly at least in a multi-user VR where many people are connected, that's another thing about the experience machine. It's just you, presumably, who's conscious. But uh, in a VR with, I'm assuming, a virtual world with many conscious beings, you can have relationships with them and get, you know, the meaning, the kind of social meaning of your life. That way, knowledge and understanding, I think you can come to have all those things in, in VR. So I think basically all the determinants of a good life. It's hard to see what's in principle missing in VR. I mean, there are some worries. Maybe if you want a fully natural life, a life which is as close to nature as possible, VR is not going to do it because it's going to be removed from nature. But, you know, but then many of us live in cities or spend most of our time indoors, and that's also removed from nature. And it's, uh, you know, it's still compatible with a meaningful life. There are issues about birth and death, you know, which are, at least it's not obvious how genuine birth and death will will work, at least in near-term virtual worlds. Maybe once there's uploading, there'll be birth and death in virtual worlds if the relevant creatures are fully virtual. But you might think, yeah, if virtual worlds lack birth and death, there are aspects of meaning that they lack. So I don't want to say they're exactly on a par with physical reality in all respects, but I'd say that you know virtual realities can at least have the prime determinants of a good and meaningful life. It's not to say that Life's in virtual reality are going to be wonderful. They may well be awful, just as life in, phys in physical reality could be awful. But my thesis is roughly that at least the same range of value from the wonderful to the awful is possible in virtual reality, just as it is in physical reality. It, it's, it sounds like a lot of people are uh, afraid that they'll be losing out on some of the important things you get from natural life if virtual life were to take over. So what are the important things you have in mind? Uh, well, uh, you mentioned people want to be able to accomplish things. Uh, people want to be a certain sort of person. People want to be in touch with a deeper reality. I certainly think in VR you can, you can be a certain kind of person, very characteristic. You can, with your own um, personal traits, you can have transformative experiences in virtual reality probably. You can develop... As a person, you can certainly have achievements in VR. You know, people who live, have spent a lot of time long term in worlds like Second Life certainly have real achievements, real relationships. Being in touch with a deeper reality, if by a deeper reality you mean nature, okay, in VR you're somewhat removed from nature, but I think that's somewhat optional. I mean, there are, in the short term at least, there are things like, you know, the role of the body. In existing VRs, embodiment is extremely primitive. Yeah, you've got these avatars, but our relationship with them is nothing like our relationship with our physical body. So things like yeah, eating, and drinking, sex, or just you know, physical companionship, and so on. Yeah, there's not genuine analogs for those in existing VR. Maybe as time goes on, um, those things will become better. But I can imagine people thinking, yeah, well, I value, you know, experiences of my physical body and you know real eating and drinking and sex and companionship and and so on in physical bodies but i can also imagine other people saying well actually in vr now we've got these in 200 years time people say we've got these virtual bodies which are actually amazing can do all that and give you all those experiences and much more and hey you should try this and yeah maybe different people would prefer different things but i do think to some extent to some considerable extent, um, thoughts about the body may be responsible for a fair amount of resistance to VR. Could you talk a little bit about the different kinds of uh, technological uh, implementations of virtual reality? So whether it be like uploading or brains connected to virtual uh, realities? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, right now, the dominant form of of VR. Well, the real, the dominant virtual worlds are not even VR at all, of course. The, the virtual worlds people use the most now are video game style worlds on uh, typically on desktop or mobile computers on 2D screens. But, uh, you know, immersive VR is picking up speed fast with virtual reality headsets like the uh, 
like the Oculus Quest and, you know, they're still bulky and somewhat primitive, but they're getting better every year and they'll gradually get less bulky and more primitive with more, uh, more detail, better images and so on. But a lot of people think, yeah, the other form factor, which is developing fast now is the augmented reality form with something like glasses, um, glasses or transparent headsets that allow you to see the physical world, but also project uh, virtual objects among the physical world. Maybe it's an image of someone you're talking to. Maybe it's just some information you need for dealing uh, for dealing with the world. Maybe it's a Pokemon Go creature you're trying to uh, you're trying to acquire for your digital collection. So that's the augmented reality form factor in glasses. And I think I guess a lot of people think that over the next ten or twenty years, the augmented and virtual reality form factors could converge. Eventually, we'll be able to you know, maybe have a set of glasses that can project digital objects into your environment based on computer processes. And maybe you could dial, there'd be a slider which could go all the way down to dial out the physical world, be in a purely physical virtual world, dial it all the way up to be in a purely physical world or in between have elements of both. So maybe, so that's one way the technology seems to be going. In the longer term, um, there's the possibility of you know, bringing in brain computer interfaces. I mean, I think VR with standard perceptual interfaces works pretty well for vision and for hearing. You can get pretty good uh, visual and auditory experiences from VR headsets, but yeah, embodiment is much more limited, um, your sense of your own body. But maybe once brain computer interfaces are possible, then there'll be ways of getting, you know, elements, these computational elements to inter to interact directly with bits of your brain, whether it's a visual cortex, auditory cortex for, uh, for vision and hearing or for, for the various aspects of embodied experience process processed by the parts of the brain responsible for, uh, for bodily experience. Maybe that could eventually give you more authentic bodily experiences. Um, and then eventually, you know, bits of the uh, potentially all kinds of computational circuitry could come to be embedded with uh, with brain circuitry in terms of circuitry, which is going to be kind of partly biological and partly digital. And in the long term, of course, there's the prospect of uploading, which is uploading the brain entirely to uh, to a digital process. And, um, you know, maybe once our brains are are wearing out and okay we've replaced some of them with uh, silicon circuitry but you want to live forever upload yourself completely uh so you're running on digital circuitry of course this raises oh so many philosophical issues will it still be me will it still be conscious and so on but then but assuming that it is possible to do this and have conscious beings and uh with this uh digital technology then that being could then be fully continuous with the uh, the rest of the world and could have um, yeah that would just open up so much potential for yeah new kinds of virtual reality combined with new kinds of cognitive process uh, possibly giving rise to experiences of the kind we can't now even even imagine now this is okay this is very distant future I'm thinking hundred plus years who knows um, you have but, long you know, AGI is, I think, timelines it, it's, yeah. Well, yeah, okay. So it all, this all does interact with uh, with AGI. I'm on record as seventy percent chance of AGI within a uh, within a century. Mm. So uh, maybe maybe that's sped up a bit. So oh, you, yeah. you shorten your insofar as this interacts with AI. I'm 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 maybe on fifty years for uh, fifty year mean expected value for years until AGI. And once we've got AGI, all this stuff ought to happen happen pretty fast. So. Maybe there's a case for uh, saying within a century, saying that within a century is conservative. For uploads. Yeah, for uploads. I think once you've got AGIs, uploads are uh, presumably... Uh, around the corner. Um, uploads are around the corner. At least if you, if, you, if you believe like me that once you've got AGI, then you'll have AGI plus, and then you'll have AGI plus plus super intelligence. And yeah, the AGI plus plus is not going to have too much trouble with uh, 
uploading technology and the like. So, so how does consciousness fit in all this? Well, one very important question for, uh, for uploading is, uh, is whether uploads will even be conscious. This is also very relevant to thinking about the simulation hypothesis, because if computer simulations of brains are not conscious, then it looks like we can rule out the, the, uh, the simulation hypothesis, because we know we're conscious. If simulations couldn't be conscious, then we're not simulations. So at least the version of the simulation hypothesis where we are part of the simulation could then be ruled out. Now, as it happens, I believe that simulations can be conscious, and that I believe that artificial, I believe consciousness is independent of substrate. It doesn't matter whether you're up and running on biology or on silicon. You're probably going to be conscious, um, and you, you can run these familiar thought experiments where you replace, say, you know, neurons by silicon chips, replace biology by digital technology, and I would argue that consciousness will be preserved. So that means at the very least gradual uploading where you uh, you know upload your your bits of your brain a yeah, say a, a neuron at a time um I think that's a pretty plausible way to preserve consciousness and preserve identity um but if I'm wrong about that and I could be because nobody understands consciousness if I'm wrong about that then uh, yeah uploads will not be conscious and these totally simulated worlds that people produce could end up being worlds of zombies so I mean that's at least something to uh, that's at least something to worry about. Um, you know I wouldn't it'd be certainly risky to uh, risky to upload everybody to uh, to uh, to the cloud to digital processes without I'd I'd like to keep you know always keep some people anchored in biology just to make sure just in case uh, just in case consciousness does does require biology because it'd be a rather awful future to have a world of uh, world of super intelligent but unconscious zombies being the only beings that exist. So, so I've heard from people who uh, agree with substrate independence that digital or classical computers can't be conscious. Are you aware of like responses like that? Slash, do you have a response to people who agree that consciousness is substrate independent, but the classical digital computers can't be conscious because the, uh, I'm not sure what the exact view is, but something like there isn't... Um, the bits don't all know about all the other bits. There's no like integration um, to create a, like a unified conscious experience. The version of this I've heard um, I'm most familiar with is comes from Giulio Tononi's Integrated Information Theory. And Tononi and Christoph Koch have argued that, yeah, classical uh, processes running on classical computers, that is on von Neumann architectures, cannot be conscious, roughly because von Neumann architectures have this serial core that everything is uh, is run through. And they argue that this doesn't have the property that Tononi calls integrated information and therefore is not conscious. Now, I, I'm very dubious about these arguments. I mean, I'm very dubious about a theory that says uh, this serial bottleneck would undermine, would undermine consciousness. I think, you know, you could, I just think that's all part of the implementation. You could still have like, um, 84 billion simulated neurons interacting with each other, the mere fact that their interactions are mediated by a common CPU, I don't see why that should undermine, uh, why that should undermine consciousness. But if they're right, um, then fine. I'd say, okay, they've just discovered something about the kind of functional organization that is required for consciousness. It needs to be you know, a certain kind of parallel organization as opposed to this serial organization. And... But if so, yeah, you're still right. It's still perfectly substrate independent. So as long as we um, we upload ourselves not to a von Neumann simulation, but to a parallel simulation, which is, I mean, obviously it's going to be the most uh, powerful and efficient way to do this uh, to do this anyway. Then uploading ought to be possible. I guess another view is that consciousness could turn out to require um, to rely on quantum computation in a certain essential way. So a mere classical computer might not be conscious, whereas quantum computers could be. If so, well, that's very interesting, but yeah. But I would still imagine that all that would also be substrate independent. And for uploading them, we'd just need to, to upload ourselves to the right kind of quantum computer. So I think, yeah, those points, while interesting, don't really provide fundamental obstacles to uploading with consciousness here. How do you see uh, problems in the philosophy of identity 
um, fitting in here into virtual reality. Um, for example, like with uh, Derek Parfit's thought experiments. Yeah, I mean, Parfit had these famous thought experiments about the teletransporter, like from Star Trek, where you duplicate your your body. Is that still me at the other end? The uploading cases are very similar to that in in certain respects. I mean, the teletransporter, you've got so many different cases. You've got, do you, uh, is the original still around? Then you create the copy. What if you create two copies? Um, and so on. Well, all these come up in the uploading case too. There's destructive uploading where we destroy the original, but uh, create an upload. There's non-destructive uploading where we keep the original around, um, but also make an upload. There's multiple copy uploading and so on. So in certain respects, it's very much analogous to the uh, the teleporter case. I mean, the change is that we don't duplicate the being biologically. We end up with a with a silicon isomorph rather than a biological duplicate. But uh, but aside from that, they're very similar. So if you think that silicon isomorph can be just as conscious as biological beings, yeah, maybe the two things roughly go together. And yeah, I mean, the same puzzle cases very much arise. I mean, prob just say the first uploads are non-destructive. We stay around and we create uploaded copies. Then the tendency is going to be to regard the uploads as very different people from the original. Um, if the first uploads are destructive, you make uh, you make copies while destroying the original. Maybe there's going to be more, much more of a tendency to regard the uploads as being the same person as the original. If we could make multiple uploads all the time, then there'll be a maybe a tendency to regard uploads as second class citizens and so on. So yeah, the the thought experiments here are are uh, complex and wonderful. I tend myself to be somewhat sympathetic with Parfit's deflationary views of these things, which is there may not be very much absolute continuity of people over time. Per the very concept of personal identity may be one of these Edenic concepts that we actually persist through time as absolute subjects. Maybe all there are is just different people at different times that stand in. There are people at different times that stand in psychological and memory and continuity, other continuity relations to each other. And maybe that's all there is to say. This kind of gets closer now to Buddhist style, no self views, at least with no Edenic capital S self, but I'm very unsure about all of these matters about identity. How would you, how, how would you upload yourself? Oh, I think the safest way to do it would be gradually, um, you know, replace my, uh, my neurons one at a time by digital circuits. If I did it all at once, destroy the original creator, uploaded copy, I'd worry that I'd be gone. I don't know that. I just worry about it a bit more. Um, to remove that worry, do it gradually. And then I'm much less worried that I'd be gone. If I can, you know, do it a bit of the time, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. To do it with maximum safety, maybe I could be conscious throughout with a continuous stream of consciousness throughout this process. And yeah, I'm here watching the, uh, the operation. They change my neurons over. And, you know, in that case, then it really seems to me as if there's a continuous stream of consciousness. And, and the continuous stream of consciousness seems to either I don't know if it guarantees identity over time, but it seems pretty close to what we have in ordinary reality. Um, you know, we're having continuous stream of consciousness over time seems uh, seems to be the kind of thing that goes along with what we usually think of as identity over time. I mean, it's not required because we, we can fall asleep and I arguably lose consciousness and wake up, and most people would say we're still the same person. Um, but still... Being continuously conscious for a period seems about as good a guarantee as you're going to get of being the same person. So maybe this would be the philosophically safest way to upload. Is sleeping not an example that uh, breaks that? I'm not saying it's a uh, it's a necessary condition for personal identity, just a sufficient condition. Just plausibly continuous consciousness is sufficient for identity over time insofar as there is identity over time. Yes, probably too strong a condition. It may be you can get identity from much weaker relations, but in order to be as safe as possible, I'm going to go with the uh, strongest sufficient condition. One neuron at a find. time. Yeah. Do, maybe do, 10 neurons at a time, maybe even col a few columns at a time. I don't know. Do you think Buddhists that realize no self would be more willing to upload? 
I would think so, and I would hope so. Um, I haven't done systematic uh, systematic polls on this. Now I'm thinking I've got to get the data from the last Phil Papers survey and find views on uploading, which we asked about, versus we didn't ask about, you know, are you Buddhist? But we did ask, do you, for example, specialize in Asian philosophy? I wonder if there could at least be a correlation between specialization in Asian philosophy and certain views about uploading, although it'll be complicated by the fact that this will also include uh, well, Hindu people who very much believe in a in an absolute self, and yeah, Chinese philosophers who have all kinds of very different views. So maybe it re would require some more fine grained survey analysis. Yeah, I love that you do these surveys. Um, they're very cool. Everyone should check them out. It's a really cool way to see uh, what what <laughs> what philosophers are thinking. Um, you know, if, if you weren't doing them, we wouldn't know. <laughs> Yeah, go to philsurvey.org. We this latest survey in 2020, we surveyed about 2,000 odd philosophers from around the world on a hundred different philosophical questions like God, theism or atheism, mind, physicalism or non-physicalism, and so on. And we actually got data about what professional philosophers tend to believe. And you can look at correlations between questions, correlations with area, with gender, with age. And so on. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. So go to philsurvey.org. You'll find the results. So uh, D Descartes plays a major role in your book, uh, both uh, due to his skepticism about uh, the external world and whether or not it is that we know anything about it. Um, and then there's also the mind body problem, which you explore. So now, since we're talking about you know, consciousness and um, the self, I'm curious if you could explain how the mind-body problem fits in all this. Yeah, in a number of ways. Um, you know, questions about the mind are not front and center in this book, but they're kind of a, they come up along the way in many different contexts. In the end, I've actually there's a yeah one part five of the book has uh, three chapters on different questions about the mind. One of them is the question we've just been raising: uh, could um, AI systems be conscious? Uh, could uploading lead to a uh, lead to a conscious being, and so on? So that's one chapter of the book. But another one just thinks about you know mind body relations in more ordinary virtual realities. You know, one really interesting fact about you know existing VR systems is that if you actually look at virtual worlds, they're kind of Cartesian. Cartesian thought that Descartes thought there's a physical world that. Uh, that um, the mind interacts with, and the mind is kind of outside the physical world, but somehow interacts with it. Well, you look at a virtual world. Yeah, virtual worlds often have their own physics and their own like algorithmic processes that govern the physical processes in the uh, in the virtual world. But then there's this other category of things: users, players, people who are using VR. And they are running on processes totally outside the virtual world. When I enter a VR, the VR has its own physics, but I am not subject to that physics. I'm, uh, I've got this mind which is operating totally outside the virtual world. And you can imagine if somebody grew up in a virtual world like this, you know, you, if Descartes grew up in a virtual world, we've got an illustration where Descartes uh, grows up inside Minecraft and gets into an argument with Princess Elizabeth about whether there could be a whether the mind is outside this physical world interacting with it. Well, you know, most people think that the actual Descartes was wrong, but if we grew up in VR, Descartes would be right. Um, he'd say, yeah, uh, the mind is actually something outside. He'd, he'd look at the world around him and say, this is subject to its physics and so on. Well, the mind is just not part of that. It's outside all that. It exists in another realm and interacts with it. And yeah, there's a perspective from the of the broader realm, which all this looks physical and continuous, but at least from the perspective of the virtual world, it's as if Descartes was right. So that's an interesting illustration of, yeah, a Cartesian interactionist dualism where the mental and the physical are distinct. It shows a way in which something like that could turn out, to, I mean, could turn out to be true under certain versions of the simulation hypothesis, say with brains interacting with simulations, and maybe even is true of, or something isomorphic of it is true even in ordinary virtual realities. And at least that's 
kind of interesting and in making sense of the uh, this mind-body interactionism, which is often viewed as a unscientific or non-naturalistic idea. But here's a perfectly naturalistic version of mind-body dualism. Yeah, I, I love this part and also found it surprising for that reason, right? Because Cartesian dualism, it always feels supernatural. Um, but here's a natural explanation. One, gen one general theme in this book is that there's a lot of stuff that feels supernatural, but once you look at it through the lens of VR, needn't be quite so supernatural. It looks a lot more naturalistic. Of course, the other example is God, where, yeah, if, if your creator is, some, is like somebody, a programmer in the next universe up, ah, suddenly God doesn't look quite so supernatural. Yeah, magic is like using the console in our reality to run scripts on the 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 simulator's world or something like that right so this is naturalistic magic magic has to obey its own principles too they're just different principles in the next universe up clearly it seems your view is is consciousness is the foundation of all value is that right pretty much yeah pretty much um without consciousness no value i don't want to say consciousness is all there is to value there might be you know other things that matter as well but i think you probably have to have consciousness to have value in your life. And then, for example, relations between conscious beings, relations between consciousness and the world can matter for value. Nozick's experience machine tends to suggest that consciousness alone is not quite enough. You know, there's got to be you know, maybe things like actually achieving your goals and so on that that matters as well. But I think, yeah, consciousness is at the very core of what matters in value. So we have virtual worlds and people don't like them, right? Because they want to have an interaction with whatever is like natural or they want to be a certain kind of person or they want the people in it to be implemented. In, they want them in real space, uh, things like that. So um, part of what makes being in Nozick's experience machine unsatisfactory is knowing that some of these things aren't being satisfied. Uh, but what if you didn't know that those things weren't being satisfied? You thought that they were. Yeah, I guess my intuition is, um, yeah, that's still bad. So, you know, there's there's this famous case that people have raised. Just say your uh, your partner is unfaithful to you, but you really, it's really important to you that your relationship be monogamous. Um, however, uh, your partnership, your partner, although professing monogamy, has gone off and had relationships with all these other people. You never know, and you're very happy about this, and you go to your death uh, without ever knowing. I think you know, most people's intuition is that is bad, that life is not as good as one where the life was the way this person wanted it to be with the monogamous partner. Um, so I, that kind of brings out, I think, that, yeah, having your goals or your desires satisfied, you know, the world being the way you want it to be, that matters to how good and meaningful a life is. And likewise, I'd say that I think it is really, like the experience machine is a more extreme example of that. Yeah, we really want to be doing these things. If I was to find out a hundred years later that, hey, any success I'd had in philosophy wasn't because I wrote good books. It's just because, uh, yeah, there was a bunch, there was a script that said uh, there'd be, you know, certain amounts of success and sales and whatever. Then boy, that would render any meaning I'd gotten out of my life perfectly hollow. So, and likewise, like, even if I never discovered this, if I had the experience of having this successful life, but it was all merely pre-programmed, then I think that would render my life, yeah, much less, less, it would still be meaningful, but just much less good than I thought it had been. So that kind of brings out that the goodness or the value of one's life depends on more than just how one experiences things to be. I guess I'm kind of pushing on consequentialist or utilitarian sensibilities here who might bite the bullet right and say that you know if you didn't know any of those things then those worlds are still okay one thing that you mentioned in your book is that it uh your belief that virtual reality is good is independent of the moral theory that one has could you unpack that a bit I don't know if it's totally independent um but I certainly think that my view here is totally consistent with consequentialism and utilitarianism that says what matters in moral decision making is maximizing good consequences or maximizing utility. Now, if you go on to identify the relevant good consequences with conscious states, 
like maximizing pleasure. Or if you say all there is to utility is the amount of pleasure, then you would take a different view of the experience machine. If you thought that all that there is to uh, utility is pleasure, then you say in the experience machine, I have the right amount of pleasure. So that's good enough. But I think that's going well beyond consequentialism. That's, uh, or even utilitarianism. That's adding a very specific view of utility. And is the one that the founders of utilitarianism had, like uh, Bentham and Mill. But I think, you know, it's easy to, I would just advocate a broader view of, of consequentialism or utilitarianism where, yeah, there are kinds of value that go beyond value deriving from pleasure or from conscious experience. For example, one source of value is having your desires satisfied or achieving your goals. Um, and I think that's perfectly consistent with with utilitarianism, but yeah, maybe more consistent with some forms than others. Is, is having your value satisfied or your preference satisfied not just like another uh, conscious state? I don't think so, because you could have two people who go through exactly the same series of conscious states, but for one of whom their desires are satisfied, and for the other one, their desires are not satisfied. Maybe they both think their desires are satisfied, but one of them is wrong. You know, one of them wants, they both want their partners to be monogamous. One partner is monogamous and the other one is not. They might have exactly the same conscious states, but one has, in one, the world is the way they want it to be. And the other one, the world is not the way they want it to be. So if desire, this is what Nozick argued and others have argued in light of the experience machine, is that, yeah, there's a kind of value in, maybe in desire satisfaction that goes beyond the value of consciousness per se. I should say both of these views, even the pleasure-centric view, are totally consistent with my general view of VR. If someone says that all that matters is experiences, well, in a certain sense, great. That makes it even easier to lead a good life in VR. But, but, um, but I think of the dialectic as the other way around. If, even if someone rejects that view, say there's more than matter, I tend to believe there's more than matter, more that matters than just consciousness. Even if you say that, you can still have a good life in a in a virtual world. I mean, there'll be some moral views where you can't. Just say you've got a biocentric view of what makes a life good. Uh, you've got to have somehow the right interactions with real biology. Um, I don't know. Then maybe certain virtual worlds won't count as having the right kind of biology, and then they won't count as valuable. So I wouldn't say these issues are totally independent of each other. But I do think on plausible moral theories, um, yeah, very much going to be consistent with being able to have a good life in virtual worlds. What does a really good life in a virtual world look like to you? Oh boy, um, you know, I think what does a really good life look like to me? I mean, different people have different values, but um, I would say I get value from partly from personal relationships from, you know, uh, getting to know people by having close relationship with uh, ships with my family, with uh, partners, with friends, with colleagues. Um, I get a lot of value from understanding things, um, from knowledge and understanding. Um, I get some value from having, you know, remarkable, having new experiences and so on. And I guess I'd be inclined to think that in a virtual world, the same things would apply. I'd still get value from relationships with people. I'd still get value from knowledge and understanding. I'd still get value from new kinds of experience. Now, there may be ways in which VR might allow this to go beyond what was possible outside VR. Maybe, for example, there'll be wholly new forms of experience that go way beyond what was possible inside physical reality. And maybe that would allow for a life which is better in, in some respects. Maybe it'll be possible to have who knows what kind of telepathic experiences with other people that give you even closer relationships that are somehow amazing. Maybe it'll allow immortality where you can go on having these wonderful experiences for an indefinite amount of time. And that could be a, and that could be better. I guess in the short term, I think, yeah, the kind of good experiences I'll have in VR are very much continuous with the good experiences I'll have elsewhere. I want to, yeah. It's a way of, you know, I meet friends sometimes in VR, interact with them, talk with them, sometimes play games, sometimes communicate, maybe occasionally have a 
have a philosophy lecture or a conference. Then, <laughs> so, so right now, yeah, what's good about VR is pretty much continuous with a lot of what's good about physical reality. But yeah, in the long term, there may be ways for it to go beyond. What's been your favorite VR experience so far? Oh boy, everything is uh, everything is fairly primitive for now. I enjoy a bunch of VR games, and I enjoy you know hanging out with uh, with friends. One uh, one enjoyable experience was. I gave a little lecture about VR in VR to a group of philosopher friends. And we were trying to figure out the physics of, uh, of VR, of the particular virtual world we were in, which was on an app called Big Screen. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you do things in Big Screen, like you throw tomatoes and what happens? And they behave in weird ways. They don't, they kind of obey the laws of physics, but they kind of don't. And the avatars have their own ways of moving. So we were trying to figure out the basic laws of Big Screen and, uh, we didn't get all that far, but we figured out a uh, we figured out a few things. We were doing science inside a inside a, a virtual world, and you know, presumably, if we'd kept going, we could have uh, we could have gotten a whole lot further and got gotten further to the into the depth of what the algorithms really are that generate this uh, this virtual world, or that might have required a scientific revolution or two. So, I guess that was a little instance of doing a bit of science inside a virtual world and trying to come to some kind of understanding, and it was at least a very engaging experience. Have you ever played any horror games? Not really, no. I'm not much of a gamer, to be honest. Um, you know, I play some simple games like, you know, Beat Saber or what is it, a Super Hot. But um, I that's not really a horror game. It's a, where super assassins come after you. But what's your favorite horror game? I was just thinking of my favorite experience, and it was probably, well, I played Killing Floor once when I first got the VR, and um, it was... Uh, probably the most frightening experience of my life like the first time you turn around and there's like um you know embodied thing that feels like it's right in your face uh very interesting in terms of consciousness and ethics and value um we can explore things like moral patience and moral agency so what is your view on the moral status of simulated people you know my own view is that uh the main thing, the biggest thing that matters for moral status is consciousness. So as long as simulated beings are conscious as we are, then they matter. Now, it may be that, you know, current non-player characters of the kind you find in video games and so on are basically run by very simple algorithms. And most people would think that, you know, those beings are not conscious. So in which case their lives don't matter, in which case it's okay to shoot these current NPCs in video games. I mean, maybe we're wrong about that. And maybe they have some degree of consciousness and we have to worry, but uh, at least the uh, the orthodox view here would be that they're not. And even on a view that ascribes them consciousness, it's probably a very simple form of consciousness. But if we look now to a, a long-term future where there are you know, simulations of brains and AGIs, inside, simulated AGIs inside these simulated worlds with capacities equivalent to our own, I'd be inclined to think that these beings are going to be conscious like us. And if they're conscious like us, then I think they matter morally the way that, uh, the way that we do is, in which case one should certainly not be indiscriminately killing uh, simulated beings just because it's convenient or just indiscriminately creating them and, and turning them off. So I guess if we do get to the point where I mean, this applies inside and outside simulations. Like if we have robot-style AGIs that are conscious, then they have moral status like ours. If we have simulation-style AGIs inhabiting simulations, they also have, um, have moral status much like ours. Now, it may be hard for, I'm sure, there's going to be a long and complicated path to actually peep that playing out in social and legal contexts, and there may be all kinds of resistance to uh, to granting simulations, you know, legal rights, social status, and so on. But philosophically, I guess I think that yeah, if they're conscious like us, they they have a moral status like ours. Do you think that there will be simulated agents with moral status that are not conscious? For example, like they could at least be moral agents um, and not be conscious, um, but in sort of a society and culture of simulated things, like, do you think that there would be 
cases where things that are sufficiently complex yet not conscious would still be traded with moral patience. It's interesting. I'm, I'm inclined to think that any system that has, you know, human level behavior is likely to be conscious. I'm not sure that there are going to be, you know, the cases of zombies where you know, lack consciousness entirely, but behave in extremely sophisticated ways, just like us. But hey, I might be wrong to say Tony and Koch are right. And that no being running on a von Neumann architecture is conscious. Then, yeah, then it might be uh, might be smart to develop those systems because they won't have moral status, but they'll still be able to do a lot of useful things. But yeah, would they still then be moral agents? Well, yeah, presumably these behaviorally equivalent systems could do things that look a lot like making moral decisions, even though they're not conscious. Would they be genuine agents if they're not conscious? That may be partly a verbal matter, but they would do things that at least look a lot like agency and making moral decisions. So they'd at least be moral quasi-agents. Then it's an interesting question whether they should be moral patients too. If you've got a super zombie system making moral decisions, does it deserve some moral respect? I don't know. I mean, I'm not convinced that consciousness is the only thing that matters morally. It may be that, for example, intelligence or planning or reasoning kind of carries some weight independent of consciousness. If that's the case, then maybe these beings that are not conscious could still have some kind of moral status as moral patients, that is, as you know, deserving to be treated well, as well as just moral agents, as well as just performing moral action. Um, maybe it would be a kind of second-class moral patiency. Certainly, if the choice was between, say, killing a being like that and killing a, an equivalent conscious being, I'd say, yeah, kill the unconscious one. But... Uh, that's not to say they have no moral status, though. So one of your theses that I'd like to to hit on here as well was that we can never know that we're not in a simulation. Could you unpack this a bit? Yeah, well, this is, you know, very closely connected to these traditional questions in epistemology. Can you know you're not dreaming now? Could you know that you're not being fooled by an evil demon now? The modern tech version is... Can you know you're not in a simulation? Could you ever prove you're not in a simulation? And there's various things people might say, ah, oh, I'm not in a simulation. I mean, naively, this can't be a simulation because uh, look at my wonderful kitten here. That could never be simulated. It's so amazing. But, you know, presumably there could be simulated kittens. So that's not a, uh, not a decisive argument. More generally, I'm inclined to think that for any evidence anyone could come up with that's allegedly a proof that we're not in a simulation, that evidence could be simulated. And the same experience could be generated inside a simulated world. So it starts to look like there's nothing, there's no piece of evidence that could ever decisively prove we're not in a simulation. And the basic point is just that a perfect simulation would be indistinguishable from the world it's a simulation of. Um, if that's the case, awfully hard to see how we could prove that we're not in a simulation. Maybe we could get evidence that we are in a simulation. You know, maybe the simulators could reveal themselves to us and show us the source code. I don't know, maybe we could stress test the simulation by running a really intense computer process, more advanced than anything before suddenly, and maybe it stresses out the simulation and leads to a, a bug or, a, or something. Maybe there are ways we could <laughs> maybe, get evidence. Yeah, maybe we don't want to do that. Yeah, okay, maybe that could shut us down. That'll be, a, an, that'll be an asterisk. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe not a good idea. But um, so there are various ways we could get evidence that we are in a simulation, at least in an imperfect simulation. But I don't think we can ever get the uh, evidence in the negative that fully proves that we're not in a simulation. We can try and test for various imperfect simulation hypotheses. But if we get just ordinary, the expected results, then it's always going to be consistent with both. And there are various phil philosophers who tried to say, ah, there are things we could do uh, to refute this idea. Maybe it's meaningless. Maybe um, we can rule it out by being the simple, the, the non-simulation hypothesis being the simpler hypothesis and so on. So in the book, I try and argue none of those things work either. And furthermore, once you think about the Bostrom-style simulation argument that, that says... Um, it may be actually 
quite likely that we're in a simulation because most populations are likely, it seems pretty reasonable to think that most intelligent populations will develop simulation technology. Once you start thinking that way, I think it makes it even harder to refute the simulation hypothesis because uh, basically because by this point, you know, these simulation style hypotheses used to be science fiction cases, very distant from anything we have reason, direct reason to believe in. But as the technology is developing, these simulation style hypotheses become realistic hypotheses, you know, ones which is actually very like good reason to think are actually likely to be developed both in our world and in and in other worlds. And I think that actually makes these, that's had the effect of making these Cartesian scenarios um, move from the status of science fiction to being kind of live hypotheses. And I think that makes them even harder to refute. I mean, you can make the abstract point that we can never prove it without the modern technology. But I think once they actually exist, once this technology is an existing technology, it becomes all the harder to epistemologically dismiss. You give some credences in your book um, for whether or not we live in a, in a simulation. Could, could you offer those now? Yeah, I mean, of course, anything like this is extremely speculative. But basically, in the book, I argue that if there are many conscious human-like simulations, then we're probably simulations ourselves. And then the question is, are there? Is it likely that there are many conscious human-like simulations? And there's a couple of ways that could fail. First, it could turn out that simulating beings like us or universes like ours is not even possible. Um, maybe the physics is uncomputable. Maybe consciousness is uncomputable. So maybe conscious human-like simulations like ours could be impossible. That's one way this could fail to happen. That's what I call a sim blocker. Um, these are things that would block these simulations from existing. So one class of sim blockers is, yeah, simulations like this are impossible, but I don't think that's more than 50% likely. I'm actually more than 50% confident that simulations like this are possible. The other class of sim blockers is, um, well, maybe simulations like this are possible, but for various reasons, they'll never be developed or not many of them will be developed. And this class of sim blockers includes the ones that Bostrom focuses on. Um, for example, I think there's two of them. Um, either we'll go extinct before we get to that level of technology where we can create simulations, or we'll get there, but we'll choose never to create them. Our intelligent civilizations will choose never to create them. And that's the other way this can, uh, this can go wrong is, yeah, we'll have, these things are possible, but that not many of them will ever be created. And I basically say, well, if these are possible, and if if they're possible, they'll be create many of them will be created, then many of them will be created, and we'll get a higher probability we're in a simulation. But then I think, okay, so what are the probabilities of each of those two premises? That conscious human like simulations are possible? Yeah. I think that's at least fifty percent. Furthermore, that's um if they're possible, will they be? Will many of them be created? I don't know. I don't know what the numbers are here, but I, I guess I'm inclined to think uh, probably my subjective credence is over 50% in that too, given that it just requires some civilization to eventually create a whole lot of them. Okay, so 50% chance of premise one, 50% chance of premise two. Let's assume they're roughly independent of each other. Um, that gives us a 25% chance they're both true. If there's a 25, if they're both true, then most beings are simulations. If most beings are simulations, then we're probably simulations. Putting all that together, I get roughly at least 25% that we're in a simulation. Now, there's a lot of room for the numbers to go wrong, but yeah, to me, that's at least very good reason to A, to take the hypothesis seriously, and B, to suggest if it's at 25%, we certainly cannot rule it out. So that gives a kind of a quasi numerical argument that we're not that we can never know that we're not in a simulation well like one interesting part that seems to feed into the simulation argument is modern work on quantum physics so we had yosha bach on who talked some about this um and i don't know very much about it but there is this debate over whether uh like the universe uh, is implemented in 
uh, continuous numbers or non-continuous numbers. Mm -hmm. And if the numbers were continuous, then um, it, the universe wouldn't be computable. Is that right? I'm not quite sure which, which debate you have in mind. But yeah, it certainly is right that, uh, that if the universe is maximally is like doing real real valued computation, then real valued computations can only be approximated on finite computers. Right. On so, digital computers. Right. So c could you explain how this inquiry into um, how our fundamental physics works informs whether or not our simulation would be computable? I mean, this is there's many aspects of that question. One thing that... Um, some people have actually looked into uh, whether our world might involve some approximations, some shortcuts. So uh, Zori Davudi and some other physicists have uh, have tried to look at the math and say, okay, just say just say our simulation. So there was a simulation that took certain shortcuts. How would that show up empirically? And this is this is okay. This is going to be an empirical test for whether there are sh shortcuts in uh, the way our physics is implemented. I don't think anyone's actually found that evidence yet, but ah, there's in principle evidence we could get of uh, of that. But um, there is the question of whether our world is fundamentally analog or digital. And if our world is fundamentally analog, you know, with perfectly precise, continuous, real values making a difference to how the universe evolves, yeah, then that can never be perfectly simulated on a finite digital computer. I would still say it could be approximated. So, and as far as we know, we could be living in a finite approximation to one of those continuous worlds. But yeah, maybe there could eventually be some empirical evidence of that. Of course, the other possibility is we're just running on an analog computer. If our physics is continuous, then the physics of the next world up is continuous. Maybe there will be analog computers developed with maximally continuous uh, quantities, and we could be running on an analog computer. Uh, like that, so I think even if our phys even if the physics of our world turns out to be turns out to be perfectly analog and continuous, that doesn't rule out the simulation hypothesis. It just means we're running on a on an analog computer in the next universe up. <laughs> okay, I'm way above my my pay grade here. Um, I'm just recalling now. I'm just thinking of how Yosha was talking that um, you know c continuous numbers aren't computable, right? So you would need an analog computer. Uh, I don't know anything about analog computers um that seems to me like hard getting... to it's, it's hard to program analog computers because they require infinite precision you know and we finite beings are not good at, at building things with infinite precision but we could always just like set the uh you know set a few starting values randomly and let the analog computation go from there and as far as i can tell there's no evidence there's no evidence that we're not living in a living in a simulation that's running on an analog computer like that I see. So if if we if we discover if our fundamental physics to be digital or analog, uh, it, it seems like that wouldn't tell us a lot about the simulation, just that the thing that's simula simulating us might be d digital or analog. In general, discovering things about our, I mean, the relationship between the physics of our world and the physics of the simulating world is fairly weak especially if you believe in universal computation, you know, uh, any classical algorithm can be uh, implemented in a vast variety of computers running on a vast variety of physics. But yeah, but there might be some limits. For example, if um, our world has a purely, has a perfectly analog physics that cannot be simulated on a finite digital computer, it could be simulated on an infinite digital computer. You can simulate uh, analog quantities with infinite strings of bits, but not on a finite digital computer. So yeah, discovering that our physics is digital would uh, be consistent with the next universe up being digital, but also consistent with it being analog. Analog computers can, analog worlds can still run digital computers. I mean, it'd be very suggestive if we did actually discover digital physics in our world. I'm sure if we discovered that our physics is digital, that would then get a lot of people thinking, hey, this is, put, this is just the kind of thing you would expect if people are running a digital computer in the next universe up, and that might incline people to take the simulation hypothesis more seriously, but it wouldn't really be um, be any kind of demonstration. And yeah, if we somehow discover that our physics is perfectly analog, I don't really know exactly how we could discover that because, you know, at any given point, we'll only have a finite amount of evidence 
which will always be consistent with just it being a very close approximation. But just say we could discover that our world runs analog physics. Yeah, then that would be inconsistent with this just being a, a digital simulation in the next universe up, but still quite consistent with it being a simulation running on an analog computer in the next universe up. I don't know how that connects to Yosha's uh, way of thinking about this. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd love to see you guys consistent. talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, Has he written about this somewhere? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, there are lots of podcasts uh, <laughs> have been talking about it, though. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so we've gone over a lot here, and um, it leaves me um, not really uh, trusting my common sense experience of the world. So pivoting a little bit here back into the, the Edenic uh, view of things, it, 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 I'm sorry if I get this, the, the word that you use wrong, but it seems like you walk away from that with a view of imperfect realism. Is that right? Yeah, imperfect realism is like the perfect thing, capital S solidity doesn't exist, but the lowercase thing, small s solidity does exist, an imperfect analog of what we initially believed in. So h how do you see the world now? Any any differently? Um, what, is the, what is the world like to David Chalmers after having written this book? What is, what is a person to you? I don't know. I mean, I think there's your everyday attitude towards the world and your theoretical attitude towards the world. And I find my everyday attitude towards the world isn't affected that much by, uh, by, deep, by d discoveries in philosophy or in science. For that matter, we mostly live in the manifest image. Maybe we even treat it a little bit like the Garden of Eden, and that's fine. But then there's this knowledge of what underlies it or what could underlie it. And that's, yeah, once you start thinking philosophically, that gets kind of mind boggling. I mean, you don't need to go to the simulation hypothesis to get, or to virtual worlds to get that reaction. I mean, quantum mechanics is quite enough. Um, oh my God, we live in this world of the quantum wave function where nothing actually has these direct positions and possibly the wave function is collapsing or possibly many worlds. It's, I mean, boy, it's just mind boggling. It is rather hard to integrate ordinary life in reality. So I think, you know, most of us just kind of go on living in the manifest image. Um, yeah, so once I start thinking about, yeah, could we be in a, uh, a simulation? It's got a similar kind of, um, of separateness, I guess. Mostly I go on living in the manifest image and don't, uh, and don't factor this in, but uh, I mean, it does open up all kinds of all kinds of possibilities once you start thinking that there is maybe this reality plus of all these different levels of reality. Like, could it be that someday it might be possible to escape this particular virtual world, or maybe when we die, um, does our code get uh, sometimes get uploaded by simulators to uh, to go hang out back in? Um, back in other levels of reality. Maybe there are naturalized versions of reincarnation or life after death. And I don't want to say this is why I'm thinking about this stuff. It's not for these quasi-religious reasons. But suddenly, you know, possibilities that had seemed very far out possibilities to me, like uh, life after death, at least come to seem like a little bit, a little bit closer. Um, and, you know, more like open possibilities than they'd seemed, seemed before. So that's at least... Uh, that's at least interesting. One thing you bring up a bit in your exploration here is is God. And yeah, so and all of these things that you're mentioning, you know, they seem kind of like science coming back, science and philosophy coming back to traditionally religious ideas, but through a naturalistic exploration, um, which is quite interesting. So do you have any different thoughts on on God after having written this book? Uh, it's interesting. You know, I'm not remotely religious myself. I've always thought of myself as an atheist. But yeah, after writing this book, I'm at least, there was a version of God that I could at least take seriously. This is the simulator. They did, after all, create the world, this world. They may have a lot of power and a lot of knowledge of this world, as gods are meant to have. On the other hand, they're quite unlike traditional gods in some ways. This, the simulator needn't be all good needn't be particularly wise. Oh, also didn't create all of reality, just created a little bit of reality. Maybe it's a bit like what's sometimes called a demiurge, uh, the, the god, the local god, the, the, you know, the underboss god who created this world, but 
wasn't the one in charge of the whole thing. So yeah, maybe simulators are a bit more like demiurges. Um, more importantly, I think I don't think I'd be inclined to erect a, a religion around the simulation idea. You know, religions come with like ethical practices and uh, really changing your way of life. I don't think there's any particular reason to orient our ethics to a uh, to a simulation. I mean, maybe you could imagine there'd be some practices that if we really believed we were in a simulation, well, there's a good chance of that. We should at least start doing some things differently. You know, maybe some people might want to try and attract the attention of the simulators. I don't know. That's all very speculative. So I don't find myself. I think the one moral of all this for me is that actually, you know, ethics and meaning and so on. Actually, you don't get your ethics or your meaning from who created you or from uh, whether it's a god or a simulator. Ethics and meaning comes from within. It comes from ourselves, our consciousness and our interactions. Do you take a line that's similar to Peter Singer and thinking that that is kind of like an objective rational space? Are you a, a moral realist or anti-realist about those things? I tend towards moral anti-realism, but I'm not sure. I find those issues very difficult. Yeah, I can get in the mood where <laughs> pain is bad. It just seems like an absolute fact. Yeah. That's just an objective fact. Pain is objectively bad. And then I get to at least to some kind of value realism, if not moral realism. So some moods all go that way. Other moods, it's just, yeah, it's all a matter of our attitude towards it. Um, finally, it's, it's a matter of what we value. If somebody valued valued pain, it would be good for them. If they didn't, it wouldn't be. And yeah, I can go I can go back and forth. I don't have a fixed view of these matters. Are there any questions that I haven't asked you that you would have liked me to ask you? Not especially. Um, you asked a lot, of, a lot of great questions, and there are a million others, but actually... One interesting thing with this book coming out is getting to do a few of these, having a few of these conversations and seeing all the different questions and different aspects of the book that different people focused on. So no, I think you've, uh, you've, we've covered a lot of territory here and yeah, these are a lot of cool things to think about. Well, I'm mindful of the time here, David. Thank you so much for, for all of your time. Um, if people want to check you out, uh, follow you um, and get your new book, where are the best places to, to do that? Probably my website, which is uh, conch.net, conch, the first five letters of consciousness, or just search for, do, do a search for my name. And then, yeah, the book is, I've got, I've got a page for the book on my website, conch.net slash reality, or just search for the name of the book, uh, reality plus. I'm not on Twitter or Instagram or any of those things, unfortunately. Maybe, I'll, maybe I should be one of these days, but uh, for, now, for now I'm not. But uh, yeah, uh, the book will be, Available January 25th, I guess, at uh, all, good, uh, all good booksellers. So I hope some of your listeners might be interested to, to check it out. All right. We'll include links to all of those places in the description of wherever you might be listening or watching. Uh, thank you so much, David. It's, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. I love hearing about your ideas. And um, it's really a great book at an important time, I think, just before all this VR stuff's about to really kick off. And with the launch of the metaverse, it's uh, really well-timed. Oh, thanks, Lucas. This was all, yeah, a lot of fun to talk about this stuff with you.